go to 138 together. 138. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. Let's all stand together as we sing. 138. On that first together. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful. Christmas to you, and uh, thanks for getting up and coming to church this morning, and uh, how many got up and you opened up your gifts this morning before church? Who did that? Anybody? Oh, quite a few of you did, all right. How many are waiting till after church to do that? Uh, a few of you are waiting in anticipation, and uh, well, it's good to see you in church today. Thanks for coming. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us this morning, and uh, let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. We do thank you for another Lord's Day uh, that you brought us to, and Lord, particularly this day where we celebrate the birth of our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And thank you for each one, Lord, who's made the effort to be here this morning. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would meet with us today, that Lord, we would be able to leave in a little bit saying, I'm, I'm sure glad I went to church this morning. And uh, Lord, give us what we need. You know exactly what we need and the need of each one of our hearts. And I pray that you'll be pleased with the service this morning that we have together. May we honor you. May we worship you. May we love you this morning. May we be a little bit more like Christ because we gather together in your house this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. On Calvary, Jesus offered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn. As the stars in the sky were fading, o'er the place where we lay fell a shadow cold and gray of a cross that would humble a king. Jesus knew when he came he would suffer in shame. He could feel every pain and sorrow, but he left paradise with his blood, he paid the price, 
my redemption to Jesus I owe. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live. From His throne Jesus came, laid aside heaven's fame, in exchange for the cross of Calvary. For my gain suffered loss, for my sin he bore the cross, he was wounded and I was set free. Dearest Lord, evermore, may the cross I adore, as I follow the path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Well, let's go back to 137. 137, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Joy to the world. We're going to sing the first and last stanza. <clears throat> On that first together. <clears throat> joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And makes a nation through the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. All right, a few announcements for us now. Listen carefully, if you would. Uh, we will have an evening service, 5.30 tonight, and, uh, and I'm going to talk tonight on the subject, Christmas Day is over, now what? All right, and uh, there's always, uh, it, it's so interesting, I just uh, finished, uh, finished up this message yesterday, and I was driving home, and that guy on the radio, um, uh, In the Garden with Ron Wilson, anybody ever hear him? And uh, he was talking about Man, you build up to Christmas Day. It's such a big thing, and it's all exciting, and everybody. He said, then you, it gets to be Christmas night, and he said, uh, and you realize it's over. It's all done. And he said, it's just kind of an empty feeling, you know? And he was talking about how, how, that, how that's so sad. And, and I was talking to him. He didn't hear me, but I was talking to him and <laughs> saying, you need to come to church Sunday night, and I'll tell you how to deal with that and uh, what to do now that it's over, all right? So uh, that'll be tonight at 5.30. Uh, if you can come back at all, we sure would love to have you this evening for the evening service. Then uh, this Wednesday, <clears throat> during the midweek service, uh, I asked Brother John uh, Combest if uh, he would give us an update on their uh, time in Uganda, and uh, he's putting some pictures together for us, and we'll talk a little bit about what the Lord taught them.
and then where they're going from here and ask him to bring a message for us Wednesday night as well. And I think he and Emily will sing for us Wednesday night also. Uh, so uh, that would be a great, great service. Last Wednesday night you have for 2016. And uh, so be here Wednesday night and you'll enjoy uh, our time with the Combats on Wednesday evening. Then <clears throat> the reminder of next Sunday is uh, Sunday school as usual, 930, church 1030. And... Um, Sunday night will be the same time as this week, 5.30, an hour earlier. Uh, we'll have our service, and uh, during that service, now normally we do this on New Year's Eve, but with being on Saturday, we thought it would be best if uh, would everybody just kind of be there, do their own thing this year and uh, get to bed at a decent hour. And, uh, you know, New Year's comes in whether you're up to see it or not, but uh, the, the, we'll meet Sunday night at 5.30. We'll have our service. We'll uh, unveil the theme for 2017. We'll give you a church calendar for the next year. Um, and then we'll go to the Fellowship Hall and uh, we have some refreshments. There's a sign-up sheet for that. Uh, there's food you bring in, just, just like New Year's Eve, only we're doing it on January 1st. <coughs> and then we'll, we'll review the year. We always have the year in review in pictures and we'll go through uh, a few hundred pictures from 2016 and we can do that on the big screen in the Fellowship Hall and uh, while we uh, enjoy some food together, okay? So uh, 9.30, 10.30, 5.30. Uh, next Sunday for New Year's Day, January 1st. And then we have our workers' dinner on January 7th. That's a Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. And you, if, you're working at, if you're a worker at Bible Baptist Church or if you ought to be a worker at Bible Baptist Church, you want to come to that dinner, all right? So uh, you'll be there for our dinner and our meeting afterwards, and uh, we'll have a program for the children, uh, school-age children that well as well that night. Uh, so uh, sign up for that, would you, and plan to be there on Saturday, January 7th. Okay? All right. Is somebody? A baby doll is talking. Okay. All right. It's brand, probably her first time in church. She doesn't know how to behave yet, so uh, we'll... <laughs> Well, hopefully she'll learn how to do that, all right? Uh, looking around to see if anybody's here today for the first time. Any first-time visitors? I don't think I see anyone. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. Let's hear from the choir.
let's go to 133 in your hymnal. One, three, three angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. One, three, three. We'll sing the first, third, and last stanzas together. On that first, angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply. Echo back their joyous strains. Gloria in excelsis in Deo. Gloria in excelsis in Deo. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Let's go over to 148. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. When you find that, would you stand with me, please? As we sing this first stanza, children, you're dismissed to junior church. Children, you're dismissed to junior church. Let's sing that first together. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I And greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
Christmas, sir. Let's sing that last together as we find our seats. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask that it stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. On that last together. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care. And take us to heaven to live with thee there. Let's sing the first verse of that again. Let's sing that a cappella, all right? We'll sing that without the instruments all together on that first. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. Be seated, if you will. Ushers will come and get our offering this morning. And, uh, give as God has blessed and prospered you and give out of a heart of gratitude to him for what he's done for you. Amen. We'll ask Brother Pole to lead us in prayer this morning. Brother John. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us to uh, come and worship you, and we pray that you'd be with the pastor as he brings the message, and that we'd be uh, able to hear the message and understand and exactly what we want to do, what you want us to do. And we do pray for the offering, that you'd uh, take this offering and bless it and make it uh, do just exactly what you want it to do here at the church. And we thank you for this church and the people that are here today. 
We pray that you'd give each one of us a blessing. If there's one here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today would he have a new birthday and ask Jesus Christ to save him. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, please. Just two verses I want us to read together this morning. They're verses 16 and 17. We're actually going to be looking at verses 1 through 17, but I thought it might be best if we didn't all read the genealogies together. So uh, we will just read verses 16 and 17, all right? As our custom is, let's stand together, let's read the scripture, and we'll begin on verse 16, ready? And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are fourteen generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are fourteen generations. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth that you have for us today from your word. Lord, I thank you for the Bible today. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to gather together and open up your word. Lord, we thank you for not only the written word, but the living word that came and uh, dwelt among us. And Lord, thank you so much for sending a Savior to save us from our sins. And Father, I pray you'll f help us to, to focus upon Christ today and your goodness to us. And make this time this morning profitable. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk on water mary did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new this child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy 
would calm the storm with his hands. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? When your sleeping child you're holding is the great Thank you, Melinda. You can have your baby now. <laughs> Been waiting for that delivery till she could sing that song for us, and uh, that was a blessing. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for another opportunity for us to open up your word and look into it together here on Christmas morning. Lord, I wish every year Christmas could be on Sunday. What a joy it is to gather with the people of God on a day we celebrate your birth. And so, Father, help us to focus. It's, it's easy to allow our minds to wander and think about what has happened already this morning, what's going to happen yet today or tomorrow. And, Lord, it would just be so easy to miss what you have for us this morning. But, Lord, I pray that you would help each one to give their careful attention for these next few minutes that we have together. And Lord, that each of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to our hearts today. And so, Father, open our understanding. And give us what we need on this Christmas morning, 2016. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> we as Christians understand something that the average person, the everyday person, I guess you could say the average lost person, does not understand. And that is... Without Christ, there can be no Christmas. Uh, to us, there's a big difference between Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Uh, there's a big difference in those two statements because of what Christ is. And I think if you take Christ out of Christmas, you don't have Christmas. Um, my, my wife and I are prone to, uh, when I'm home, which is a couple nights out of the week, to... Uh, my wife loves to watch the Hallmark movies of the Christmas. Oh, some of you do too, I take it, huh? How many of you have those playing in December in your house? Yeah, quite a few of you. You know, they're, they're so predictable, you know what I mean? And you, can, you know what's going to happen. But you know what? What you begin to notice after a while of those, after watching those, is, is there's an emptiness there. Because the, whether they talk about Christmas magic or Christmas love or Christmas this or Santa this, Christ is missing in most of those. And it just gets to be pretty empty because without Christ, there's no use to celebrate Christmas. And so <clears throat> most, most, listen, most unsaved people don't have a problem with all the other things of Christmas, but, <clears throat> excuse me, they have a difficulty with Christ at Christmas. In fact, they have a difficulty with Christ most of the other 11 months of the year as well. And they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> the world likes Christmas well enough because they like the money it generates. Used to be stores would wait till Thanksgiving to put things out, you know, for Christmas. And now I think they start in August or, or September putting things out for Christmas. And, you know, it wouldn't it be great if we would get as excited about 
the Lord Jesus and in his birth and celebrating his birth as the world does to make money at his birth and to make money at Christmas time. I think we, we, Christ, if I could get Christians as excited about Christmas as Walmart is, we, we'd have something going. We'd get something done in the world. But how do you get excited about Christmas? How do you, how do you have genuine joy about Christmas? I'm going to give you some thoughts, and I say you, you do that by first looking backwards so you can look forward. The way to look forward is to look backward. Now, I'm going to explain that to you here in just a minute. When you look at Matthew chapter 1, and I know this would be a, maybe a little bit of an odd passage, and as I said, I was going to read the first 17 verses, and then when I went in my mind, all of us reading these names together, it didn't go so well. So I thought maybe we shouldn't do that. And, but, but what you have in the first 16 verses, first 17 verses of Matthew, is the genealogy of Joseph, which is the earthly father of Christ. <clears throat> you have his genealogy here uh, of the birth of the Savior. And I want to give you three, three thoughts this morning that as we look backward in the genealogy, and by the way, that's become a pretty popular thing. There's several websites now where uh, you can join and you can trace your ancestry backwards and find out who you, you know, uh, some things you want to find out, maybe some things you don't want to find out, but you find out about uh, distant relatives and where you came from and all this kind of thing. And here we have that for the Lord Jesus. And, and I just want to draw three simple truths. I won't keep you long. Uh, you'll be out by 2 o'clock dinner and you'll be fine, but I won't keep you long this morning. But if you just listen carefully, just three simple thoughts about uh, as we look backward in order to look forward, Okay. And, and the first thing I see in these genealogies, and, and notice it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar, Perez begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, Aram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Naasen, and Naasen begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab. And, Re and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David be the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And it goes on uh, through the genealogy. And one thing you notice right away is this. Number one is the grace of God that is displayed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The grace of God that is displayed in the lives of individuals. The Bible says in John 1, when Jesus Christ came into the world, in fact, uh, you're in Matthew 1. Hold your finger there. We'll come back there. But look at John chapter 1, would you please? John chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. John 1, verses 16 and 17. The Bible says of Jesus, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And now, I don't think that grace didn't exist before Jesus because God is always gracious and always been gracious. But certainly with the coming of Christ, we have the grace that has appeared. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. He's taught us to be gracious. Gracious is to, to give people undeserved favor. And certainly as you look at the genealogy here of Jesus Christ, there's some people that had some undeserved favor of God uh, that, that are in the genealogy. And the grace they had is grace that's available for every one of us. The, uh, the undeserved favor of God that they enjoyed is what we get to enjoy. That favor of God on their life is what we get to have in our lives. It can be the same way. God has not changed. There's some surprises here. I don't know if you caught them as we read through the genealogy. Did you notice verse number 3? Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. And Perez begat Ezra and Ezra begat Aram. Tamar. Tamar was a Gentile. She married one of Judah's boys and he passed away. And he, dad promised her, his father, this would be her father-in-law, promised her that he would have another one of his sons marry her when he got of age and he didn't keep his promise. 
And she ended up seducing him and had children by him, by her father-in-law. You say, man, that's pretty wild. Yeah, but she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. You say, how's that happen? The grace of God. The grace of God. But wait a minute, there's someone else here. Rahab is mentioned. That's Rahab or Rahab. Rahab is, is, of course, you know, from Jericho. Rahab the harlot, that's what everybody remembers her as. She wasn't that for most of her life. But by the way, that's why it's important, young people, to be careful what kind of reputation you get when you're young because it's awful tough to shake that off. It's awful hard to remove that. For most of Rahab's life, she wasn't a harlot. But when we mention her name, that's the first thing most people think about. And uh, here she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. How did she get there? The grace of God. The grace of God. You go on, you go on and you have Ruth. Ruth is mentioned in there. Wait a minute. Ruth, uh, Ruth came into the picture when Elimelech and Naomi went down into Moab. Moabites. Where did the Moabites come from? Moabites came from Lot and his two daughters after they escaped out of Sodom. An incestuous relationship and this group of Moabites and Ammonites were born and they were just wicked people, immoral people. And out of that wicked and immoral people, the ones who God said you don't have anything to do with, God picks one out and says, I'll use her. And he uses Ruth in the line of in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Manasseh and Ammon are mentioned. Two of the worst kings that Israel ever had. Manasseh and Ammon. And there they are in the line of Christ. Whether there were psalmists or shepherds or prophets, priests, kings. Hey, extraordinary people in the line and just ordinary people in the line. I guess we could say some subordinary people in the line but they're all in the lineage of Christ. They're all there. And just individuals, hey, you know what's great? God uses individual people just like you and me. And, and I'm glad the Bible's not full of perfect people. We would look at it and say, there's no hope for me. No hope God will ever use me. And if you think, if you look down your eyes on somebody and say, well, God will never use them, well, I'm glad you're not God. Because God uses some amazing, He does some amazing things and He allowed, uh, listen, I, I've learned one thing in my 34 years of pastoring a church and 34 years of being in the ministry and that is I, I gave up years ago on telling God who He can use and who He can't. Because God can use anybody He wants. And He does. He does. He doesn't have to consult me. And He'll use anybody. And He used these folks in the lineage of Christ. You know, His grace will still work in your life today. Amen. Some of you here this morning, you think, well, with what I've done or my past or what I've been involved with in my life, oh, God will never use me. God will, God will never have anything in my life. Oh, yes, He can use you. And He desires to use you. And He desires to, to, to allow you, even if, if not the lineage of Christ, but to be used by God. Hey, if His grace was in His ancestors, His grace can also be in His descendants those who come after Christ, as well as those who came before Christ. And we can be trophies of His grace in our life. And everything you and I, that's why the Apostle Paul, though he had his past and he had all his problems, he had all his things that he had done wrong, you know what he ended up saying? He's saying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. It's only with God's help and by God's favor. So no, no sin is too great for His blood to cover. No sin is too great for His blood to cover. The Bible says in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin. And by the way, His blood doesn't cleanse any differently after you're saved than it does before you're saved. Boy, that's quiet. Because sometimes I run into people and say, well, this person did this or this person did that. And they say, well, was that before he was saved or after he was saved? Well, if he's forgiven, what difference does it make? You're, you're thinking, well, if it was before he was saved, then he's forgiven, that's right. But if he's after he's saved, well, then that, he's disqualified. 
Now wait a minute, forgiveness is forgiveness. The blood cleansing you is the blood cleansing you. It's not going to make a difference whether that blood cleansed you before you were saved or when you got saved or after you got saved. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You, for, you confess and forsake and you'll obtain mercy. No, no sin is too great for His blood to cover. No problem's too small to bother God with. He's concerned about the, the very hairs of our head. Okay? He's concerned about the minute details of our life. And there's no, hey, obviously if nothing's too small, nothing's too big for God either. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Hey, we're celebrating the fact that a virgin, a woman that had never known a man, gave birth to a child. That's a medical impossibility. That's a human impossibility. But with God, all things are possible. That was nothing hard for God to do. And so I see the, the grace of God in, in, in the lineage of Christ. Looking back, I see the grace of God. What's that help me do? Look forward to the grace of God in my life. Look forward that His grace will be there for me as well. And it will be there for you also. But then I see something else as I look back in the lineage, in the genealogy here of Jesus. And that is God's sovereignty is displayed. God's sovereignty is in display. These, these names, these 42 names are listed in 14, 14, and 14. Three 14s, okay? And the first 14 names go from Abraham to David. This was supposed to have been the, the great era of faith. Abraham was called the friend of God. David was the man after God's own heart. I mean, all the way through, you have some, some really great men of faith, but the truth is, that was a rough time. There was a lot of unbelief. There was a lot of uh, uh, Abraham lying about his wife Sarah. David and, and his sin of adultery and murder. And, and on down through the, the history, there was a great apostasy. It wasn't quite the era of faith that we thought it would be. The next 14 names go from David to a guy named Jeconiah. That's the royalty. The royalty of God, the era of the kings of Israel. And boy, that was going to be a great time. That was going to be a, a, a royal time, so to speak, uh, for the nation of Israel. But you don't have to read through the kings very much to realize there weren't very many good ones. In fact, many more bad ones than good ones. And they led them into idol worship and, and, and led them away from God, idolatry, rather than closer to God. And so that was a difficult, difficult period in, in the, the, the genealogy and in the lineage of Christ. The third division, the last 14, was the era of captivity when they were taken captive into Babylon. And that, that of course, failure and defeat and misery and all the things that, that, that go through with, with being taken captive under the judgment of God. And yet all these things, as we look at them, we think, man, that didn't work well and that didn't turn out real good and, boy, that, that period was a mess. And guess what? God still brought forth His Son right on time. None of that messed God up at all. You know, sometimes we look at things in our history, we look at things that are going on now in the world, and we think, oh, what if this happens? Oh, what if that happens? What's God going to do? You know, I know guys who they used to preach prophecy sermons about Russia, and, you know, and then it was the USSR, and they thought, well, i got to tear those sermons up. And we, you're, you, you go back to some of the sermons in the 70s, and they had all figured out all the nations lining up and everything, and now everything's all different now, and they're tearing their sermons up and saying, well, that didn't work. You know what? God never tears up his script. Everything, God knows exactly what's going on. It doesn't matter what man does. God is overall. And we're not gonna, you're not going to mess up his plans. We call that the sovereignty of God. That God will work his plan. And God, God brought forth his son just like he said he would. According to his perfect plan. Adam all the way to Joseph. Like the weaver who carefully places each and every stitch. God carefully weaved, wove that scarlet thread all the way through the Old Testament until the fullness of time came and he brought forth his son, Jesus, into the world. You know, nothing is going to frustrate the purposes of God. That's really, that's really what Romans 8.28 says. Romans 8.28, and we know. Now, wait a minute. No, we, we think. 
No. And we know all things do what? Work together for good. Now listen. To them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. There are conditions to that promise. Okay? Somebody says, well, I know, I know. Everything works, everything's for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you made a bad decision. It's true. Don't, don't always say, oh, no, it happens for a reason. This will, be, this will be for my good. No, you have to love God and you have to be called according to His purpose. And his purpose, the next verse says, is for to be conformed to the image of his son. So if I want to be conformed to the image of Christ, and I want to love the Lord, that means I'm loving him, I'm willingly, sacrificially giving myself to God for his benefit without any thought of return. That's loving God. And I want to be conformed, I want him to conform me, I want him to mold me into the image of his son. Then I claim the promise that all things work together for good. So why do I get worked up over bad things? Why am I getting upset when things don't go the way I think they should go? When, when, when somebody can't show up or somebody shows up late or somebody doesn't make it or I don't get what I've asked for I don't, and all of a sudden I get all upset, irritated. Wait a minute, does God work in all things together for good or not? Do I believe that promise or not? Boy, that's quiet. We get all upset and we get all worked up over things and we, we're, we're, what we're saying is, God, don't you know what you're doing? And God must laugh. And say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I think God may look at us and say, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> God's going to take care of it. It doesn't matter about your interference, it doesn't matter about Satan's interference. God will, his plans will come to pass. That ought to be a great comfort to us. And listen, that's not something we guess at. That's not something we cross our fingers and hope for. The verse says, we know. We know this to be the case. And so when things seem to you to go upside down, and when things seem to be just backwards the way they ought to be, just say, God, I'm glad you have everything under control. Because I sure don't see how this is going to be any good. But I trust your promise. Of Romans 8 28 I just want to love you and I want you to conform to the image of your son and I know that all these things will work together for good God's sovereignty I see that when I look backward and if it happened in the past I know it'll happen in the future okay so I see the grace of God see the sovereignty of God and then number three I see the love of God the love of God it was in God's timing that Jesus came. There's a verse, I'll read it to you in Galatians 4 and verse 4. The Bible says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Did you notice when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. When the, when the time was exactly right, God said, Okay, I'm sending my Son to earth. God's never early. God is never late. God is always on time. Right on time. And so Matthew's careful to demonstrate here that uh, Jesus is not accounted for in this lineage. Oh, he's identified with them, but he's separated from them as well. Did you notice verse 16? Matthew 1 verse 16. And you see it all the way down through. And Jacob, what's the word after Jacob? Begat. Joseph, the husband of Mary. Okay? But you go back into 15 and 14 and 13, and it's all so and so begat, and he begat, and he begat, and he begat. You notice that? But when you get to 16, jo Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, and he begat Jesus? No. The husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which is called Jesus. Christ. The birth of Jesus listed differently than any of the other 42 names because it was different than any of the other 42 names. He had no earthly father. Mary of Mary of whom was born Jesus. Nobody, no, the only thing that can count for his birth is a miracle because Joseph, there was no father to beget him. He's divine. God sent forth His 
Son. That which is conceived in you, Mary, is of the Holy Ghost. God put that seed in there. And that's, that's why the blood that went through Jesus' veins was royal blood, was godly blood. It was not tainted with the sin nature. See, as for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Because you, you were all born, all of us in here are born with the sin nature. And, and I, I, you know, that, 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 that's in your, it's in your blood. You don't, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. We're born that way. And so we, we understand we're inherited that sin nature. Christ did not have that sin nature in him. He was born of the virgin. He was born of God. And so he had no sin nature and, and he did not sin. Human and yet godly. A direct act of God in the fullness of time. In fact, over in John chapter 1 again, when John wrote about it under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he said this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hey, Jesus didn't just come into existence in Bethlehem. He always was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. But He took on flesh and became a baby in Bethlehem that we celebrate today. We beheld His glory, John said. Have you? Have you beheld His glory? I think it, it talks about, you know, when you think about that babe in the manger, do you think about that baby growing up? And both those songs, Mary Did You Know and Born to Die, talk about the shadow of the cross over that baby. And that baby was there to die. Not as a baby, but as a man. Tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. You know why? So we can have a victorious life as well over sin. Because Jesus did. I hope this Christmas you'll look back and by looking back, it'll help you to look ahead. Because you'll see the grace of God. And you'll, you'll see the sovereignty of God. And you'll see the love of God. And, and as the songwriter said, "'Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And you'll see that it'll continue to guide you and take you to where you need to go. In verse 18 of Matthew 1, notice it says, The birth of Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Have you experienced that? Hey, the question today, look at me, is have you allowed Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin? Have you allowed him to be your Savior? There are people in hell this morning who believe He's the Savior. They believe He died for the sins of the world. But that doesn't save you. That's just believing common knowledge. What saves you is when you say, I believe Jesus died for my sin. And I want Him to be my Savior. And you trust Him as your Savior. That's salvation. He'll save you from your sin. I tell you what, that's the best gift you'll ever receive on Christmas is if you receive Christ as your Savior. The only son of a very wealthy man had his 21st birthday on Christmas Day. His mother gave him some gold cufflinks and engraved gold pins. His uncle and aunt bought him a tailor-made set of golf clubs that combined flight control technology as well as movable weight technology and he, being an avid golfer, he was just thrilled at his new golf clubs. 
He expected to receive a sports car from his dad. He had dropped numerous hints, heavy hints. Instead, his dad told him he loved him and handed him a present that was wrapped. The boy opened it and found it to be a box, and he opened the box, and it was a leather-bound Bible with his name inscribed in the front. Angrily, he tossed the box and the Bible aside and stormed out, saying, all the money you have and you get me a Bible? They never spoke again, in spite of the fact Dad tried to contact his son numerous times. Years went by. The young man got a call from his uncle one day to say that his father had died and had left everything to him. He went home and began to go through his father's belongings and he, he found that box and he opened it up and the Bible was still inside. Curious, he took the Bible out of the box and when he went to open it, it fell open at a passage his father had marked in the Bible. And as he looked at the page, he noticed Dad underlined Matthew 7, verse 11. Matthew 7 and verse 11, it says this, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things unto them that ask? Hmm. As he read it, a car key fell from inside the Bible. It had a tag on it with the dealer's name on it for the sports car that he had wanted years earlier. On the tag, which was right beside the date of his 21st birthday, he read the words, Paid in full, love, Dad. Hmm. That's really what God did when he sent his son into the world. Because Jesus would die on the cross, and God would say, it's been paid in full. Love. Dad. Love your Heavenly Father. And Jesus paid the price for our salvation. If you never received His gift of eternal life, no better time to do it than Christmas Day. If you are saved, would you remember as you look back, and I hope maybe even look back over your own life, you'll see the grace of God. You'll see the sovereignty of God. You see that God was in control, and I hope you'll see the, the fact that God loves you and that, that he loves us unconditionally. And you'll keep that in mind as you move forward for the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for your wonderful gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for including this genealogy in Matthew. Lord, we realize there's some, uh, in, our, in our pride, and that's what it is, we would look at some of these characters that are mentioned and think, how could in the world could they be in there? How would, how would God ever use their life? And yet, Lord, the truth is we ought to look at ourselves and say, how would you ever use my life? Thank you for being a God of grace, mercy. Thank you for your sovereignty that, Lord, you really do. We know that you can work all things together for good when we love you and we're called according to your purpose. And, Lord, you love us. You're always on time. You always do the right thing. Lord, sometimes we get in a hurry and we get ahead of you. Oh, Lord, help us to know that the first thing you ever did was you loved us because you first loved us. And Lord, well, I pray that we would love the Lord Jesus. The Lord, we wouldn't love everything about Christmas and not love the Christ of Christmas. But may we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. May we love not just the gift, but may we love the giver. The Lord Jesus. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. But right now, just for a moment, just between you and God, 
I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, I have accepted God's gift of eternal life. I've realized at some point in my life that Jesus did pay it all. It's been that, that my eternal life, my sin debt was paid in full by Jesus when he died on the cross. And I've trusted him as my Savior. And that's who I am trusting in to take me to heaven. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony this morning. Would you hold it up, Christian, and say, that's me, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. If you're here this morning would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know that I've ever received his gift of eternal life. Pastor, pray for me today. Would you let me pray for you? Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I'm not sure I'm saved. I think I saw every hand go up. I wonder how many believers this morning could just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. I don't know if it's the grace of God, the sovereignty of God, the love of God. Not sure what part of that aspect spoke to your heart today. But you'd say, the, the Lord helped me today. And by, by looking back, it's helping me to look forward to what God has in store for me in the future. Pastor, the Lord spoke to my heart today. Pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me. Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, then you respond to him. Take a little time on Christmas morning to bow the knee to the Lord. And just thank him for speaking to your heart and respond to him this morning. Tell him you love him. That you're so glad for his grace and thankful for his grace and his sovereign plan for your life. That you desire to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Lord, I pray your will will be done in every heart and life today. I pray, Lord, you'll hear our prayer as we bow the knee to you at this invitation time. Lord, draw us close to you. Put your arms around us this morning and help us as only you can. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet if you would please. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you? Born to die upon Calvary. Jesus suffered my sin That's to right. forgive. Born to die upon Calvary. He was wounded that I might live. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were fading, o'er the place where he lay fell a shadow golden gray, of a cross that would humble a king. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might Jesus knew when he came, he would suffer in shame. He could feel every pain and sorrow. But he left paradise, with his blood he paid the price. My redemption to Jesus I owe. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Dearest Lord, evermore may thy cross I adore as I follow the path to Calvary. A 
of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Sing the chorus with him. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Father, we thank you now for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Sure has been good to be in church this morning. Thank you for each one that's made their way here, and Lord, I pray you'll be with us as we go our separate ways now after the service, and uh, some will still have family get-togethers and uh, loved ones they'll be meeting with, and I pray you'll give them safety as they travel. Uh, Lord, I pray those who can be here tonight will be back this evening with the church family, and that uh, once again you'll meet with us and give us a good evening service. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful that you go with us when we leave this place. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, aren't you? Let's sing it together, Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>